Hello, this is the first of two lectures addressing snow loads. In this presentation titled Basic Snow Loads, we'll talk about how to look up the ground snow load, how to determine structure coefficients that are needed to calculate the flat roof snow load from a ground snow load, and then talk about how to address uh, snow acting on sloped roofs. In a separate presentation, we'll delve into more advanced topics like dealing with snow drifts, uh, sliding snow, um, and things of that nature. Let's get started. To get started, this slide shows some of the references that you have available with respect to snow loads. First of all, Chapter 7 of the ASCE 7 standard is where you will find provisions on snow loads, and with respect to the International Building Code, snow loads are found in Section 1608. Chapter 4 of the Finella textbook covers snow and ice loads and is up to date with respect to the 2016 edition of the ASCE 7 standard. Finally, Chapter 4 in the Tally textbook is a good reference for snow, ice, and temperature-induced loads, but bear in mind that some of this material is dated. There is a lot of good background information there, but references to specific provisions are likely out of date by several years or several editions of the ASE 7 standard. I should also mention that there are significant changes coming in the 2022 edition of the ASCE 7 standard relative to the 2016 edition of the standard. I'll summarize these major changes in a separate presentation, but at this point, <clears throat> just note that this presentation covers the snow loads that are consistent with the 2016 edition of the ASCE 7 standard. I'm not sure where this picture came from, but I think it captures exactly the problem that we are trying to solve. Uh, this slideshow is adapted from one that uh, Thomas Michael Basehart put together back in the 90s, and, and he gave it to me when I started teaching this class. And uh, I just love this picture because it's exactly what we're after. We're trying to figure out how much the snow weighs on the roof of that house. The process for determining the amount of snow load on a structure starts off with knowing how much snow load is on the ground at the structure's location. That's covered in section 7.2 of ASCE 7. After we know that, we determine how much snow load would be present on the roof of a structure if that roof were flat. And then it's in some cases, that's the end of the problem because some roofs are flat. Then the next step would be to determine how much snow load is present with uh, a sloped roof. Then finally, uh, we cover additional topics, or what I call advanced topics, including partial loading, unbalanced loads, drifts, roof, protection, roof projections, sliding snow, and then rain on snow surcharges. So in this presentation, it's the first three that are going to be covered. The uh, fourth box there will be uh, addressed in a separate presentation. And then the images on this slide just go to reinforce the, uh, the idea that was conveyed on the previous slide. We start off with the ground snow load, P sub G, P for a pressure, G for ground. Then we, from that, we determine the flat roof snow load, P sub F. And then from there, we determine the sloped roof snow load, P sub S. And then uh, after we know that, then we start looking at more particulars about the roof, uh, places where snow is going to slide or drift or accumulate because it's in a valley and things of that nature. All right, so the snow load that we determine for our structure is dependent on a number of different things. First, geography. Obviously, it's going to snow more in Alaska than it is in Hawaii or in Florida. So where we're at uh, on the Earth is uh, probably the first and most important variable. The second, uh, it depends on local conditions. Uh, is the uh, uh, building site exposed uh, or is it rather sheltered? And that plays a, an important part. And then the third is the specifics of the structure. What is it intended to be used as? Um, how uh, warm is the structure inside? And what is the shape of the roof? Okay, after we've determined the general snow load or uh, basic snow load as I call it, or the balanced snow load as ASCE 7 refers to it, we start looking at more specific considerations like partial loadings, unbalanced snow loads on roofs, uh, sliding snow, drifts, rain on snow, and ice, and things of that nature. So the photo on this slide is interesting in that it shows an engineer or a technician measuring the snow load on a flat roof. 
So this individual has gone onto a roof. He's got a snow shovel there. You can see that. He's uh, excavated away most of the snow, but he's left a column there that represents probably one square foot worth of surface area. You can see that he's measuring the depth of the snow. He also has a bucket and a scale there so he can measure the unit weight of the snow and thus he could estimate the actual snow load on the building. And so what we're doing is we're calculating the snow load and uh, um, the measurements that this individual has taken has probably gone into the development of the equations that we'll use. So this is the equation that we use for calculating the flat roof snow load, P sub F. It's equation 7.3-1 out of ASCE 7. The equation reads that uh, P sub F should be taken as 70% of C sub E times C sub T times I sub S times P sub G. So P sub G is the ground snow load. Um, I sub S is the importance of the structure. C sub T is a thermal factor for the structure and C sub E is an exposure factor for the structure. This equation is applicable to the design of flat roofs, um, which is defined as a roof where the slope is less than or equal to five degrees, which is about one inch per foot. However, in determining the, uh, uh, the load on a sloped roof, we need to first determine the flat roof snow load and then modify it to get to the sloped roof snow load. The starting point for determining ground snow loads is a map that's in section 7.2 of ASCE 7. Now the same map exists in the International Building Code. It's uh, figure 1608.2, but uh, I'm going to refer to ASCE 7 uh, almost exclusively throughout this work. So anyways, um, you refer to that map for the contiguous United States, and then there's a table for locations in Alaska. This slide shows a map from ASCE 7 that is used to determine the ground snow loads for the contiguous United States. So there are a number of different things you could look at here. There's uh, different uh, sections for different states. You can see the orange sections here. There are light blue sections that represent case studies. And you can also see that uh, the rest of the map looks kind of like a topographic map, except that the ISO lines here represent changes in the design ground snow load that we would uh, examine. Let's take a look, closer look at the northeastern United States in the Midwest. And uh, one of the things you would note right away is that for most of Ohio, you end up designing for a ground snow load of 20 pounds per square foot. <clears throat> Okay, this is the table that we would refer to if you were designing for snow in Alaska. So there's a number of different Alaskan cities uh, that are represented here. And uh, of interest is that the ground snow load that you design for uh, varies from a low of 25 pounds per square foot, not much higher than you'd see in Ohio, all the way up to uh, 300 pounds per square foot for Whittier, Alaska. So that's uh, quite, uh, quite a, a high load. <clears throat> Now, uh, there were a number of states that were highlighted on the map, uh, and they have their own specific tables as well. And most of um, those cases are cases where the snow intensity varies quite a lot from one po portion of the state to another. It depends uh, on um, the mountains that are there and possibly um, other uh, features like lakes and things of that nature. So for uh, places like Montana, New Mexico, Colorado, and even New Hampshire, you're going to uh, be referred to a table of uh, cities as opposed to using the map directly. Now, the, uh, uh, the map that uh, we base the ground snow loads on was developed by taking measurements at 204 National Weather Service stations, and each one of those stations had at least 11 years worth of data. And the data is based on a 2% uh, probability of exceedance each year. That is, uh, that correlates to a 50-year mean recurrence interval. Okay, <clears throat> the uh, commentary to this section in ASCE 7 contains ground snow loads at the uh, those 204 stations, so you can reference those. And here is a snapshot of what those uh, uh, station re records look like. So you can see different uh, station locations, different uh, um, 
maximum observed snowfalls and the 2% uh, uh, exceedance snowfall. So if we look at Ohio, for example, you can look at the Dayton area, the, uh, the 40 years of records. They have a maximum observed snow load of 18 pounds per square foot, and the 2% probability of exceedance is 11 pounds per square foot. All right, now some of the areas of the map were labeled case study or CS, and that indicates that you have to do a site-specific uh, study of the area to determine what the snow loads are going to be. If we look here again at the Northeast and uh, Midwest, you can see a number of those locations labeled as case studies. And uh, this is uh, my, my analysis. I think that most of these are based on either mountainous regions or regions uh, that are near bodies of water. <clears throat> Excuse me. I grew up in uh, northwestern Pennsylvania, so my hometown is right about there, Warren, PA. And uh, I know for uh, having lived there for a number of years that we get a lot of lake effect snow coming off of Lake Erie. So the, uh, the wind tends to blow across Lake Erie. And uh, when it does that, it picks up moisture from the lake. And then when uh, that moisture gets over top of the land, it just drops in snowfall. Uh, so you could see that the, uh, the, the ground snow load that you would design for in uh, western Pennsylvania is 25 pounds per square foot. But when you get close to the lake or when you get into a region that's uh, dictated by lake effect snow, then that can be quite a bit higher. This uh, region down here in the uh, south center part of Pennsylvania and into West Virginia and Virginia is a mountainous region. And uh, that carries up through uh, what, um, New York and Vermont as well. So because of those mountains, you would have a uh, case uh, specific so the, uh, the design load for Western Pennsylvania is 25 pounds per square foot. This is a photo taken from Erie, Pennsylvania in February of 2018. And this photo was posted on the National Weather Service webpage. And even though the ground snow load for Western Pennsylvania is 25 pounds per square foot, this snow here represents a much uh, larger load than that. Um, I would estimate that this uh, is about six feet deep in this location. And uh, with uh, snow having a unit weight uh, that can be as high as 30 pounds per cubic foot, that would correlate to a ground snow load somewhere between 150 to 200 pounds per square foot. So far an exceedance of what the mapped value is. And that's why case studies are needed in locations like this. Okay, information on how to conduct a case study is uh, found in the commentary to ASCE 7, uh, section C7.2. Okay, and there's also a table there that uh, uh, gives you some guidance on how to convert different probabilities of exceedance, different uh, mean recurrence intervals if the data that you're provided with for the case study doesn't match that required for ASCE 7, which is a 50-year mean recurrence interval. The next topic is that of roof exposure. And uh, roof exposure is uh, reflective of two things. It's reflective of the type of terrain that the structure is built in, um, basically how much wind it's going to see. And it's also a function of how much uh, shelter is provided to the roof by surrounding uh, features like uh, trees or other structures. In general, uh, if you have uh, a windy situation where you have unabated wind, it's more likely that the snow is going to blow off of the structure than it is to settle on top of it. So when you have a case where the roof or the structure is exposed to, to winds, then you end up designing for a lower snow load than situations where the structure is relatively sheltered, either by uh, topography or by uh, trees or adjacent structures. This table, table 7.3-1 uh, rather, shows the exposure factor C sub E, and you can see it as a function of two different things. Uh, first of all, it's a function of the terrain category, which de defines the topography, and it's also a function of the exposure of the roof. Uh, one thing to, to look at right away, though, are the bounds of what this factor C sub E are. At the low end, you have a, a small, smallest value of one 
of 0 0.7 and at the upper end you have a, a high value of 1.2. So we have a, a rather limited range so um, you know one approach would be to design for the most conservative case and just use a value of 1.2 for C sub E. But uh, let's look at it a little bit more specifically. We'll talk uh, about the terrain categories first and then we'll talk about the exposure of the roof second. Okay, there are three major uh, surface roughness categories. They start with category B, oddly enough. Category A was retired uh, a few code cycles ago. I tried to figure out what category A was, but uh, I wasn't able to find it in uh, just a few minutes, so I gave up. Basically though, category B is a suburban residential area. Uh, so like the burbs, so to speak. So this looks like, uh, much of what you would see anywhere between uh, Cincinnati and Dayton, uh, the urban sprawl, if you will. So you have small structures in that region, but nothing too large. This also covers urban areas with uh, numerous closely spaced obstructions, uh, having the size of a single family dwelling or larger. So um, the image in the lower left shows a small city that might be on the order of like uh, Hamilton or Middletown or something like that. Category C uh, is uh, uh, likely to see more wind, so open terrain or grasslands uh, with scattered obstructions that are generally 30 feet or shorter in all directions. And then finally, category D is a situation where you're going to have unobstructed wind acting over a body of water, so something on a coastline. This picture shows, it looks like some type of a reactor on the coast of either a lake or an ocean. So if you're designing a structure in Erie, for example, and it's right on the shoreline, then uh, that would be a category D uh, situation. So then that brings us to roof exposure. And um, there are three classifications for this. The first that we'll discuss is fully exposed. And that's a roof uh, that's exposed on all sides with no shelter afforded by terrain or higher structures or trees. In contrast to that is a sheltered roof where you have a building or structure that's constructed among conifers uh, that act as obstructions for the wind or maybe built among other buildings. And then the third uh, roof exposure is partially exposed, which is somewhere in between the first two. Now, when you are determining the roof exposure, it's important to uh, um, uh, consider the life of the structure. So you might be building a, uh, constructing a building in an open area with no trees, it might be fully exposed and you get a lower value of C sub B but you must consider the possibility that someone might plant uh, some, some uh, evergreen trees that would grow tall enough to provide roof exposure uh, in 20 years. And then all of a sudden the C sub B value is increased and uh, it might, uh, it's important to foresee that uh, potential when you're doing the design of the roof and determining the uh, snow loads. Okay. Um, when we look at the uh, um, obstructions, they have to be close to the building in order to provide shelter. So a distance of 10 times H naught. If the only obstructions are a few trees that are gonna lose their leaves in the winter, then you don't count them and the structure is basically classified as fully exposed. <clears throat> H uh, naught is the, the height above the obstruction above the roof level. So you can see in this uh, image, which comes out of the Finella text, how H naught is measured. Uh, there's the distance X, uh, the horizontal dimension, and then H naught is the vertical dimension measured from the peak of the roof. Okay, note that the heights that are, that are used to establish the exposure category that we talked about a few minutes ago are different than those that uh, are used here. When we talk about exposure category, we're gonna refer to uh, chapter 26, which governs, which is what governs for wind loads. And in that case, the height is measured from the ground level and not from the top of the roof. Okay, the next topic is that of uh, thermal conditions. And uh, the, um, the thermal conditions in our structure are important in determining the snow loads. Um, so uh, basically what we're going to do is determine a value of C sub T. T stands for thermal based on table 7.3-2 as a function of the thermal conditions. And this is what that table looks like out of ASCE 7-16. So uh, again, if we're looking at uh, the bounds of C sub T, we can see that we have a lower bound of 0.85 and an upper bound of uh, 1.3. 
So um, look at the uh, different categories of the there. Um, basically, a value of C sub T equals one for all structures, except as indicated below. Then you have structures that are basically kept as cold, um, structures kept just above freezing, unheated open air structures, freezer building, until you get to the last one, which is a continuously heated greenhouse. Okay, the uh, thermal conditions um, must be uh, chosen so that they represent the structure over its entire life. Uh, you wouldn't want to uh, consider a greenhouse structure that's uh, kept warm uh, now, but then would be repurposed for something else later on, and you would end up with a higher C sub T value uh, during the 20th year of building life as opposed to the, uh, the, the way it was designed at its opening. And then uh, basically the thermal factor is larger for colder roofs than it is for lar uh, for warmer roof roofs. So the idea, <clears throat> excuse me, is that if you have a, a warm structure, like a, a heated greenhouse, then some portion of the snow is going to melt off of the roof and it's not going to accumulate at the same rate that it would uh, as if you had a colder structure. <clears throat> In fact, it's possible for P sub F to be larger than P sub G. It's, large, it's possible for the flat roof snow load to be larger than the ground snow load. For some unheated structures, if you have a freezer building, um, you know, like a meat packing plant or something like that, you might get more snow accumulating on the roof of the structure than you do on the ground around the structure, uh, because the uh, the roof might actually be colder uh, than the ground is in some cases. And the last factor that we uh, will discuss is the importance factor. And in this case, it's the importance factor for snow. So the second column in this table. So we're going to determine the risk category for our building and then uh, look up the value of I sub S. The uh, uh, value of I sub S ranges from a low value of 0.8 uh, to a high value of 1.2. And this is the table, uh, ASCE table 1.5-1, that gives the uh, risk categories for the structures. So a general building uh, is a category two. Um, buildings uh, that are designated as essential facilities are category four. So we would design for an I sub S of 1.2 in that case. Or you have uh, uh, insignificant structures like garages and, and uh, uh, storage sheds that would be a category one. And finally, the last topic in section 7.3 is that of a minimum snow load. There is a minimum roof snow load for low slope roofs um, where the ground snow load P sub G is less than or equal to 20 pounds per square foot. Then P sub M, the minimum snow load, is taken as the importance factor I sub S times P sub G. In other cases where P sub G is greater than 20 pounds per square foot, then uh, P sub M is taken as 20 pounds per square foot times I sub S. Okay, the minimum snow load only applies to uh, flat roofs or low slope roofs uh, with a slope less than 15 uh, uh, degrees, or if you have a curved roof, it's a uh, 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 with a slope less than 10 degrees. Okay, these minimums account for a number of situations that can develop, uh, particularly important in regions where the ground snow load is small, 20 pounds per square foot or less. Uh, in those cases, uh, you can get a single storm that uh, could be an outlier, um, but renders the, uh, the equation for P sub F uh, inaccurate. So the value of 0.7 coupled with the factor C sub E and C sub T could lead to a design flat roof snow load that is uh, too low to account for these single storm events. Okay, the last thing that we'll talk about in this presentation is that of sloped roof snow loads P sub S. So we've uh, looked up uh, or determined the uh, P sub G values, the ground snow load. We've determined the factors C sub E, C sub T, and I sub S to get the flat roof snow load. And now if our roof is sloped, we're going to modify that to get the sloped roof snow load. So uh, when we determine that, though, it's important to note that the, uh, the snow load that we determine, it acts on a horizontal projection of the surface. And we'll illustrate this in a couple of different places. But uh, um, that's uh, one of those cases from structural analysis where we present that. And at first, it seems kind of uh, abstract. Why would we do that? And the snow load is an example of that. So uh, when we determine the sloped roof snow load, the, uh, the balanced snow load or the general snow load, 
is taken as uh, p sub s equals c sub s times p sub f. So c sub s is the slope roof factor, or the roof slope factor, I suppose. And uh, it's determined by looking it up in uh, one of three different charts. So here are the three different charts that we use to determine the slope roof snow load or the roof, snow, uh, the roof slope factor C sub S. So you have uh, one chart, uh, figure A, which deals with warm roofs. Um, you have a second chart, uh, chart B, which deals with cold roofs, where C sub T is equal to 1.1. And then a third chart, uh, chart C, that deals with cold roofs where C sub T is equal to 1.2 or more. Now, each of these three charts has uh, uh, two different lines. It has a solid line and it has a dashed line. And uh, basically, uh, those lines represent the case where you have a slippery, unobstructed roof where uh, snow is likely to slide off rather than accumulate. And then the solid line is all other roofs where the roof is sticky enough, uh, like shingles, for example, um, where the uh, snow can accumulate without sliding off. So what exactly is a slippery or non-slippery roof? Well, a slippery roof is one that doesn't have much uh, friction to it, like a sheet metal or something like that, that uh, the snow can slide off of more easily. And uh, ASCE gives us this guidance. They say slippery surfaces shall include metal, slate, glass, and bituminous rubber and plastic membranes with a smooth surface. In contrast, they say that membranes with an embedded aggregate or mineral granule surface shall not be considered smooth. And then lastly, they go on to say that asphalt shingles, wood shingles, and shakes shall not be considered to be slippery. So this gives us some guidance. Um, you know, you can use your common sense here as well. Anything that's basically uh, smooth with a low uh, friction would be a smooth, slippery roof. Uh, anything that has some kind of a friction associated with it is not going to be a slippery roof. So this slide uh, covers a warm roof slope factor. Um, so C sub T is less than one, uh, less than or equal to one when you have an unobstructed, unobstructed slippery surface that will allow snow to slide off of the eaves. Okay, provided that you don't have a ventilated warm roof with a uh, insulation factor R greater than or equal to 30 for, uh, uh, or a ventilated roof with R greater than 20. And uh, exterior air has to be able to circulate freely under a ventilated roof from its eaves to its ridge. So if you've ever done any construction, you'll see that uh, we put insulation in the roof, but then you put in, uh, sometimes they're made out of plastic, sometimes they're made out of uh, styrofoam, little ducts to allow air flow to, uh, 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 allow air to flow under the roof, but uh, outside of the insulation. That way that the roof is actually cold, um, but the, uh, um, the house is still insulated. Okay, warm roofs that don't meet these conditions are designed for the solid line in the chart. Uh, uh, roofs that do meet these conditions are uh, designed using the dashed line. Okay, and then in this uh, slide, you can see a similar criteria for uh, cold roofs uh, with C sub T equal to 1.1. Uh, and in this chart here, where you have a cold roof with C sub T equal to 1.2, use the uh, dashed line for slippery uh, um, uh, roofs, and you use the uh, solid line with uh, the other roofs. All right, so to review, um, the first step is to determine the ground snow load, P sub G. After we know that, we determine the structure coefficients, uh, C sub E, the exposure coefficient, C sub T, the thermal coefficient, and uh, I sub S, the importance with respect to snow. Then we determine the flat roof snow load, P sub F is equal to 0.7 times C sub E times C sub T times I sub S times P sub G, the ground snow load. And then if we're dealing with a sloped roof, we get the sloped roof uh, load, P sub S, which is equal to C sub S times P sub F. And the sloped roof snow load P sub S is applied to a horizontal projection of the roof. Even if the roof is sloped at a 45 degree angle or more, the, uh, the sloped roof load is applied to a horizontal projection of that roof. And then finally, if we need to, we'll examine partial loadings, drifting, and uh, other topics that will be uh, addressed in the second of these two uh, lectures.
Okay, this concludes the first of the two lectures on snow loads. Uh, after looking over this, you should be able to work through some example problems where you find the ground snow load for a given site, determine the structure coefficients with respect to snow, determine the flat roof snow load, and if needed, determine the uh, snow load that would act on the sloped roof. So the next uh, presentation and the next lecture on snow will cover the advanced topics, including partial loadings, uh, drifting, um, sliding snow, and things of that nature. All right, thanks.